Hello, everyone. I am Xinxiang Cindy Kai of the American Institute for Research, or AIR. I'll be monitoring today's webcast entitled Employment After Traumatic Brain Injury. This webcast is offered through the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, KTDRR, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, NIDR. The Center on KTDRR has a subgrant with the American Institute for Research to develop a series of webcasts and to establish a community of practice to help promote the understanding and use of evidence-based practices in the field of vocational rehabilitation, or VR. I am the project director of the subgrant, and my colleagues Anastine Hector Mason, Emma Hickens, and Patricia Mather have been instrumental in the development of this webcast and related community of practice. I also want to thank my colleagues Joanne Starks and Ann Williams from SEDL, or CEDL, in Austin, Texas, for their support of the webcast. Today's webcast is one of our first collaborative efforts now that CEDL has joined AIR as an affiliate. Here's our agenda for today. After an overview of the webcast topics, I will introduce our presenters and we will have a facilitated discussion. We'll then wrap up by letting you know how to become part of this discussion. In the first webcast, we discussed the issues surrounding the use of practice guidelines in the VR field. The most recent webcasts have focused on research and practice in motivational interviewing in VR, supported employment for transition age youth, and returning to work after burn injury. In today's webcast, we will follow the same thread by translating research to inform VR service delivery. We have a dialogue with a researcher, a VR counselor, and a state head injury coordinator to discuss employment after traumatic brain injury, or TBI. In our dialogue today, we'll discuss four central questions. What is research and its evidence base on employment for individuals with TBI? What does research say about the key issues that VR practitioners should consider in supporting clients return to work after TBI? What are some of the VR practices related to supporting TBI survivors returning to work? And what is the role of practice guidelines in supporting VR practitioners to work with clients with TBI? We're happy to have three presenters with us today. Dr. Jeffrey Quezer is a professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation, neurosurgery, and psychiatry at Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College of Virginia campus. Alyssa Bonzer is a VR specialist at State of Maryland's Division of Rehabilitation, and Maria, Maria Crowley is the State Head Injury Coordinator for the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. Now I'm going to turn to Dr. Quezer to ask him to comment on the literature base about employment for individuals with TBI to address the following questions. What is TBI? What are the critical factors related to employment after TBI? What are key issues that VR practitioners should consider in helping clients with TBI? What are some interventions or best practices that VR practitioners can use to support TBI survivors in returning to work? And finally, what are the gaps in literature base and research on return to work after TBI? Dr. Quizer, please take it over. Hello, and, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, very interesting and uh, useful presentation. Um, it's important in talking about brain injury to have a common definition. And the definition that myself and my colleagues often use is that traumatic brain injury refers to damage to brain tissue caused by an external mechanical force as evidenced by medically documented loss of consciousness or post-traumatic amnesia, also called PTA, or by objective neurological findings on physical or mental status examination 
that can reasonably be attributed to traumatic brain injury. And this definition has been adopted by the traumatic brain injury um, model systems of care. Now, I thought it might be very interesting for people to appreciate some of the early effects of traumatic brain injury. And many times I find that vocational rehabilitation specialists post-acutely don't really understand or are confused by the fact that people with brain injury have so many challenges and so many difficulties that they face. And it really, understanding brain injury really starts by understanding what happened to the person early after their injury. And so I borrowed an excerpt from an actual um, discharge summary to give you a sense of what early on some patients may face. Primary diagnosis, traumatic brain injury. In the chart, it also lists secondary diagnosis for this patient, hypertension, methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus pneumonia, otherwise known as a staph infection, right neurosensory hearing loss, and left partial rotator cuff tear. Brief history of a patient that you might see two or three years down the road as a vocational specialist. The patient is a 31-year-old male admitted after a pedestrian versus car accident with loss of consciousness and an initial Glasgow coma scale of 70 in the emergency room. And I told you that this was a verbatim discharge summary. And normally when I'm presenting this summary or, or slide, I would ask people, what does it mean when a person has a Glasgow coma scale of 70? And some people don't realize this, but the GCS or Glasgow coma scale, the range is actually 3 to 15, and 70 uh, reflects most likely a, an error in the chart that was not caught by anyone. You can't really have a 70 on the GCS, but a 7 on the GCS um, means that a person had a severe brain injury. Generally, severes are classified as GCS uh, 3 to 8. Head CT shows interparenchymal hemorrhage, bleeding in the brain, contusions to the right frontal and left frontal slash temporal lobes. So there was damage. Sometimes people ask me about, well, what is damage? What's typical when you see damage to the right side of the brain? Or what's typical when you see damage to the left side of the brain? In this particular case, and in many cases, you tend to see damage to both sides of the brain. Subdural hematoma, subarachnoid and non-displaced right occipital fracture. So you're seeing a fracture of the skull. You're seeing bleeding in the brain. And the patient had neurosurgery in the form of uh, decompressive craniectomy to evacuate the subdural uh, hematoma. And another thing this chart indicates is that this patient had a partial left temporal lobectomy. Uh, some of you may know that the temporal lobes are really important, particularly the temporal lobes on the left side, because they're, they're responsible for language comprehension as well as auditory memory. But this patient was so badly injured, they removed part, an important part of his brain to save his life but that will also leave him with challenges and problems for years to come. The patient also had a non-displaced left clavicular fracture, which is non-weight bearing. The patient had a tracheostomy. The patient could not ingest food normally and had a G-tube inserted. And the hospital course was complicated by pneumonia and staph uh, infection for which he was treated for 21 days. So. In summary, the main point of showing you this discharge summary is to help you understand that it's, it, the, some, many of these severely injured patients are, have a combination of uh, life-threatening illnesses or injuries, and this person, um, the, the early chart note would indicate to me if I saw, if I looked at this chart today, I would say that this is a person who's going to have great difficulty in the long term trying to find and keep a job. So I tell, I tell my students, be aware of the, the patient's initial injury, and that will give you some hints as to the degree and type of challenges they're likely to face employment-wise in the long term. It's not simply a brain injury. And here you can see infection, bone fractures, bleeding in the brain. 
uh, all these things together uh, comprise uh, the patient's early status. Now, I, I thought it would be interesting for people to see this. Uh, these photographs were actually appeared in a national newspaper. And the caption to these two photographs is uh, a construction worker who had six nails driven into his head by a high-powered nail gun is expected to make a full recovery. And there's a reason why I thought this slide might be interesting. It's really unbelievable to me that they would that the newspaper would say that this person is going to make a full recovery. Um, obviously, a person like this is going to have cognitive deficits. And there's also a, a psychological trauma. Um, and I do think the public is often misled. You know, the, the newspaper may print a, a photo like this uh, because they want to show drama and they want to interest the readership, and the drama is, look how horribly this person has been injured. Um, but despite the horror of this initial injury, this person is going to live a perfectly normal life. And as a clinician who has treated some of these folks with these nail gun injuries to the head, um, it's, I would say that it's highly unlikely that this person's life will ever be the same. And one of the things I think is a challenge for people with brain injury is the misinformation of the general public and employers about the true effects of traumatic brain injury in the short and in the long term. Now, part of um, the way that I've been involved in helping people with brain injury is there's several different ways. One is I've actually worked to develop supported employment programs, and that's part of what I've spent the mid-80s and early 90s doing, but I've also spent a lot of my time uh, doing research on employment after traumatic brain injury. And I thought it would be interesting for you to see some of the data we collected on employment stability uh, through the Traumatic Brain Injury Model Systems uh, Research Program. And basically, we did a study that we published in 2003 in the Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation. And we categorized people as stably employed, unstably employed, which meant they're employed sometime post-injury, and uh, employed sometime and unemployed at other times. And then there were people who were unemployed at all three follow-ups that we did in the first three to four years post-injury. But what you can see if you look closely at the slide is that admission GCS was fairly sim similar between the stably and employed and the unemployed. The, uh, these three factors, days unconscious, days in acute care, and days in rehabilitation, um, can tell us a little bit prognostically about the likelihood that people are going to be unstably employed. And you can see that people who were unemployed at all three follow-up intervals, they had, they were five, they were unconscious five time, for five times longer. They were in acute care uh, for twice as long as those who were stably employed. And they were in rehabilitation more than twice as many days as those who were stably employed. So what this data told us is that when we see patients early on that these three factors, days unconscious, days in acute care, days in rehabilitation, that these factors can give us some prognostic information about a patient's likelihood to be stably employed in three to four years post-injury or unemployed for the first three to four years post-injury. One of the factors in this study of employment stability that uh, was important as a prognostic is whether a person was able to drive a, a vehicle independently or not. And in this case, you can see that 63% of people who are stably employed were able to drive their own vehicle, whereas only 10%, whereas 10% of these people unemployed all three, at all three follow-up intervals were able to drive their own vehicle. Uh, education has some prognostic value for predicting employment stability. You can see that 47% of people 
who had a college degree, nearly half of the people we followed who had a college degree were stably employed, whereas if you look at the high school graduate category, you could see that half as many high school graduates or less than half as many were stably employed. So it appears that having an advanced uh, having completed a college degree or having an advanced degree makes someone much more likely to be able to find and keep a job in the long term. Now, one of the things that we were interested in some, uh, when we first really got started with our research was what are the challenges that people face who are unemployed five to 34 years post-injury? And I've broken this, the results of the study up into several slides, but what we were interested in is systematically identifying the challenges that people face in the long term with that information giving us some guidance about the types of interventions and support this, that people need when they attempt to return to work. And this is a list. We, we gave a group of people a uh, questionnaire that, and they were basically given a list of challenges or problems and asked to rate how frequently they encountered those problems. And my recollection is that there were 108 items on this problem checklist. The number one challenge or the number one most frequent problem reported by people five to ten years post injury was boredom. And you can see on this slide Listed number two is move slowly, number three, frustrated, number four, difficulty lifting, five and six, reading and writing slowly. And so what you can see from this slide is that slowness that is an important issue. And the other thing is that you can see that there's a combination of motor issues, for example, move slowly. There's a combination of psychological issues and there's a combination of cognitive issues. All three categories of issues combine to comprise the challenges that people face five to 10 years post-injury, people who are interested in finding employment. Now, there's very little information on what happens to people in the long term after traumatic brain injury. And for people who are unemployed, we separated this data into a group of people who were unemployed who were 10 to 34 years post-injury. The top thing, the most frequent issue reported is frustration. And in my clinical practice, I, most of the people that I talk to, both survivors and family members talk a lot about the frustration of returning to an almost normal life after brain injury. The, the, most, the 10 most common problems for people who are 10 to 34 years post-injury are a combination of psychological, motor issues, and cognitive issues. Frustration, forget people forget what they read. They are impatient with others. You can call that a psychological or social factor. They feel like they are misunderstood. They're bored. They lose train of thought, which can be considered a cognitive issue. They read slowly, they write slowly, they move slowly, and if you sneak a peek at number 11, they think slowly. So these are the major challenges of people 10 to 34 years post-injury. And we, when we looked at combining the data for 5 to 10 years and 10 plus years, what we found was two major categories of issues. One issue I'm going to call slowness. People with brain injury move slowly, write slowly, read slowly, think slowly, and learn slowly. And in our society, there's a great emphasis on people doing things quickly. And the way that employers or industries make, make lots of money is they get their employees to work more quickly to speed up their output without increasing their salaries. And so speed is very important to employers in terms of their profit, yet one of the greatest challenges that people face after brain injury is that they do things slowly. The second issue, which is an issue that until recently has been somewhat neglected, is what I'm going to call mood problems or psychological well-being. At least for the first 10 or 20 years, 
the research on traumatic brain injury really emphasized the physical and medical aspects of injury. But what we've learned over the last five or ten years is that psychological issues or psychological and emotional concerns or emotional recovery is also an important issue to, rec to appreciate when we're working with clients and trying to understand the long-term impacts of injury. So when we surveyed people who were 5 to 34 years post-injury, the most um, in the top 15 lists for both groups was the issue of boredom or inactivity. I used the word frustration earlier, and that's commonly a term commonly used not only by people with brain injury but also by their family members. People are described as impatient, and people describe themselves as misunderstood. So I just want to, for the purpose of being holistic and not missing an important characteristic of people who are many years post-injury, I wanted to mention the emotional and psychological issues. Now, I thought it would, uh, I thought it would be interesting to uh, ask people a question. And that question is, who do you suppose drinks more after injury? People who are unemployed or people who are employed? And some time ago we did a study looking at alcohol use patterns in people who were employed and unemployed. And what you can see is that 34 per, in this study that we published in the Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation, we looked at the proportion of people, the percentage of people who were abstinent. 34% of people who were employed were abstinent, and 62% of people who were unemployed were abstinent. And so what this means is basically that the rate of abstinence among the unemployed is twice as great as people who were employed. So if you were the ones who said that people who, um, if you were among the group of people who said that the, the unemployed drink more, these data would suggest just the opposite. In fact, look at the column for moderate or heavy drinkers. 46% or nearly half of the people who were employed were moderate or heavy drinkers. Contrast that to the number of heavy and moderate drinkers among the unemployed. It's near the rate for employed people is nearly twice as great in the moderate and heavy category. And some of you may be puzzled by this, but when we began to think about this issue, and and it, and it reminded me of specific individuals who were unemployed. I, I can recall a number of patients or clients that I saw who were unemployed. They couldn't drive. They had no money, and they were living with their parents. It was when people became independent, when they had money in their pockets, when they were working, when they weren't living and being supervised by their parents or siblings. It was at the time when people became most independent, when they were able to drive down to the local liquor store and pick up a pint of liquor. That these data strongly suggest that the time where we need to be most concerned about people with brain injury and their alcohol consumption is when they get back to work because that's when they have much greater access to alcohol and illicit drugs. So I was asked to think a little bit about what does the research say about the major return to work barriers. On my list is the fact that employers focus on productivity, which basically translating into English is how fast people can work for the lowest wage. Many work environments are competitive and versus uh, collaborative and te while te teamwork may be um, su suggested or encouraged, uh, there is often a great deal of competition in workplaces, people competing for uh, higher salaries, for higher status positions, and so the person with a brain injury who may be at a disadvantage may be unlikely to get as much support as would be ideal if people were working truly as a team. Ignorance and stereotypes contribute to intolerance of disability. There is a tendency to compare clients to how they are 
they were pre-injury, especially if they return to the jobs they were at before. And what I have often had disagreements with people about whether it's good to go back to a previous position or not. It may seem comfortable, but what happens is when people go back to their former position, they are compared to how they used to be. And for many people, uh, the, their ability to be productive uh, is diminished, which uh, which encourages other people to be disappointed, their, their supervisor, their colleagues, to be disappointed and discouraged, and especially in their productivity. Transportation is a challenge. Um, at least in the first two or three years post-injury, many people can't drive, and so they can't get to work. And the, and the research that we've done shows that if you can get yourself to, to around town, if you can get yourself to work independently, you're much more likely to be able to hold a job in the long term. The other thing is a lack of, of training. Um, people with traumatic brain injury, because their problems are so complex and diverse, as we talked about early on today, because their problems are so complicated and they're difficult to see with the naked eye, um, it's really important to have employment specialists who are experienced and wise and resourceful, and there is a lack of trained people uh, to provide uh, support services. Let's talk briefly about the key issues to consider when a person is concerned about a client keeping their job in the long term. And that's what's really important is not just finding a job, but keeping that job in the long term as well. The factors that are important to consider are the person's expectations for the timing of their recovery and their ability to carry out the most important aspects of their job. How much support is there in the workplace? Some workplaces are extremely competitive or people are competing for wages and, uh, and higher level positions. The person who is likely to do best is the person who's supported by their colleagues. We talked earlier about how when people become more independent, when they're making more money, when they have greater access to transportation, they're at greater risk. It's important to monitor clients' alcohol use, particularly when they first start to get back at, at work and start earning a good paycheck. One important issue to consider is whether it's really the best thing for the client to go back to their old position or whether they should consider a different job where people won't be comparing them to how they used to be, which can be very painful. One of the things that's happened over the last several weeks is the price of gasoline, at least in Virginia, has been almost cut in half. And an issue uh, that people face sometimes, especially when they live in rural areas, is the cost of working. Uh, some people have to buy a car, people have to pay insurance, and people have to pay for gas. That's going to cost money. Does the person, uh, is the person going to make enough money to justify the expenses that come with working? And let me finish up on the issue of patience and persistence, which are psychological qualities or character qualities. The people who tend to do best after the most severe injuries are people who are patient and persistent. Those two ingredients are clearly important when considering what might need to be done to support a client in the workplace. What are the best practices if you're a nurse psychologist looking to deliver good services to people who've had a serious injury? It's important to do a thorough assessment of cognitive abilities, academic abilities, and emotional well-being to get a sense of the challenges and strengths that a person has. It's important to appreciate how much support they're getting from the family and to encourage family members to be supportive in constructive ways. It's important to educate clients and families about the common challenges that people face after they have a brain injury the cognitive challenges, the vocational challenges, the psychological challenges. And stress management is a key ingredient to effectively maintaining employment. We try to teach our clients skills, how to communicate effectively, how to set reasonable goals, how to solve problems efficiently. Emotional issues can be a problem in the workplace. We've talked about frustration. Helping clients manage and control their anger and other intense emotions in the workplace is often critical to them keeping a job in the long term. 
for employment specialists, it's important for them to be unobtrusively involved in training work-related skills. Teaching clients compensatory strategies is extremely important, as is promoting positive collegial and supervisor relationships. Uh, the value of stress management uh, can't be overstated. It's important to help people help clients solve problems on their own. It's, it's easy to tell clients what to do and give them advice, but the long-term goal is to help clients learn to solve their problems independently. Less time with the employment specialist over time is what's going to happen as people begin to learn their jobs, as clients begin to learn their jobs. And what when, when the employment specialist is phased out, what other types of long-term supports are available in the workplace, uh, especially to address changes in the workplace which inevitably occur. I wanted to um, read a quote from an article we published in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation uh, that helps give you a sense of best practices. From our prospective research, um, what we've learned is that the earnings reported by people with traumatic brain injury in supported employment far exceed the costs associated with employment services. Supported employment services are effective when provided by well-trained staff. Staff training is a key factor dedicated to understanding the needs of the people served as well as the business. Many programs are not adequately prepared to serve people with TBI at this time. Clearly people with severe brain injury can face many challenges and present as a challenge to the rehabilitation team. Perhaps the most important conclusion that can be drawn from our research on supported employment is that people with severe injuries and their families should not be led to believe that returning to work is impossible. And when we talk about the attributes of the situation, the motivation of the individual and his or her family, acceptance of limitations as people appreciating the new challenges they face after their injury, and supportive assistance from the rehabilitation agency are the key elements of success. Let's briefly talk about the gaps in the literature. And it's been interesting as someone who's done research on employment for probably more than two decades, there are still many, many gaps in the literature. What we need to understand now is what are the best strategies for getting people back to work? To what extent can people be self-employed? How well do people do in temporary staffing situations? What are the most effective return to work models? Are there preventative interventions that we can do that don't require people to lose their jobs before we can serve them? And one of the biggest challenges has been getting people back to work in higher level positions. What are the most efficacious models for getting people back to work in high level positions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kweiser. Now we're going to turn to Alyssa Bonzer who will share her experiences as a VR counselor in supporting employment for individuals with brain injury. Her discussion will address how VR practices are guided by research in the state she works in, what interventions and strategies she and her colleagues have used to support clients with TBI, what is the knowledge base for supporting clients with TBI, what are the challenges in working with TBI survivors, and what help do VR counselors need to support TBI survivors who return to work? Alyssa? Thank you, Cindy, for inviting me to participate in this presentation. Today I'm going to spend some time discussing how Maryland's employment initiative with acquired brain injuries came about and has been guiding VR counselors' practice in Maryland with this population. In Maryland, our practice is guided by research when providing vocational rehabilitation services to individuals with acquired or traumatic brain injuries. Historically in Maryland, rehabilitation counselors developed relationships with community rehabilitation providers to facilitate employment services for individuals with traumatic brain injuries. In 2006, 
Maryland advocates identified that there was a lack of comprehensive services for individuals with acquired or traumatic brain injuries. This research was reported to the Maryland Department of Disabilities, which resulted in funding being allocated to Division of Rehabilitation Services, also re referred to as DOORS, for us to take the lead on developing specialized employment services for individuals with acquired brain injury. As a result of receiving the specialized funding, DOORS formed a steering committee consisting of stakeholders around the state. ABI rehabilitation counselors were then designated and distributed around various state offices. Services were determined based on best practices such as neuropsychological evaluation, cognitive rehabilitation, and long-term supported employment. Based on research, five phases of service delivery were identified and individualized based on the consumer's needs. The phases consisted of assessment, compensatory strategies, work readiness, assistance with job development, and job coaching or supported employment. Supported employment job coaching is unique to our agency as it allows us to provide long-term job coaching to this population rather than a typical 90-day follow-up period. In order for individuals to participate in this program, they must meet the agency's federal eligibility criteria just as other disability populations do. Under the order of selection, the individual must be categorized as Category 1, which is most significantly disabled. Also, the primary cause of the disability must be a brain injury to participate in the program. The final criteria is that the individual must not be actively abusing substances or they must be committed to recovery. The ABI Consortium was developed in partnership with providers and practitioners to meet on a quarterly basis and review the progress made by DOORS consumers participating in this research study. The research study was launched in 2006 and funded for the first five years. Now it's currently funded through DOORS. The purpose was to expand employment opportunities for persons with significant disabilities. Members included DOORS administration and VR counselors, community provider representatives, advocates from the Brain Injury Association of Maryland, and the research team, which was from University of Maryland. The research team was implemented to analyze the efficacy of the specialized service delivery model and effectively meet the individualized needs of consumers with brain injuries in securing and maintaining competitive employment. The confidentiality of participants was protected with data collection maintained on an aggregate basis only. This slide indicates that the research team found that the majority of the individuals identified in this study were Caucasian males. When looking at this next slide, more than three quarters of the study participants had a high school education or above when receiving services. Results of the study also identified the majority of participants to have a traumatic brain injury as a result of a motor vehicle accident, followed by cerebral vascular accidents being the second most common cause of traumatic brain injury. As of September 2011, it had been determined that 84 study participants were successfully rehabilitated, while 51 were closed as unsuccessful due to various reasons. Interventions that I use with my traumatic brain injury consumers vary based on the individual needs of the consumer. I use interventions such as cognitive rehabilitation to improve concentration, memory, and processing speed. And sometimes I do this in conjunction with individual psychotherapy to allow the individual insight into their strengths and deficits. Compensatory strategies are often determined in collaboration with the VR counselor, the community rehab provider, and the individual.
Vocational assessment and work adjustment training are beneficial to this population to determine realistic employment goals and improve the individual's work attitudes, social skills, and provide exposure to work simulation activities prior to re-entering the workforce. Individualized job development is provided to assist the individual in developing a resume, complete applications, follow up on job leads, practice mock interviewing, determine appropriate accommodations, and follow up on interviews with employers. Job coaching is also provided to assist the individual in learning job duties, develop compensatory strategies to compensate for deficits, and assist the individual in maintaining appropriate relationships with supervisors and coworkers. I find it is imperative to provide an ongoing assessment of the individual's needs throughout their services to facilitate long-term job retention. Collaboration and partnership is also imperative on working with this population. Team meetings consisting of the individual, VR counselor, other medical or rehabilitation professionals, family members, and other advocates supporting the individual should also be included. My knowledge base for supporting this population is mainly provided by an ongoing training program through the DOORS ABI consortium meetings. In addition to training, I am also a second year graduate student at George Washington University majoring in rehabilitation counseling. I've worked with a brain injury caseload since 2008 and have been with the state of Maryland since 2005. Strategies I have used to support this population overcome barriers to employment are to make the job as procedural and repetitive as possible, also involving the individual in all aspects of planning and always maintaining open communication. Multiple modalities for learning should also be provided depending on the individual's needs. I also encourage the individual to use external aids in their personal and professional life to assist with planning and memory deficits. Low-tech external aids can be inexpensive and as simple as pencil paper systems to help organize the individual. Some common ones that I use are checklists, wall calendars, notebooks, timers, and medication dispensers. On the other side of the coin are more high-tech and costly external aids. Most of these aids consist of electronic devices. I find smartphones to be the most efficient if the individual has access to one because they be because they combine several useful features, such as alarms, calendars, and timers. Finally, some other useful strategies that I use with consumers uh, to benefit them are behavioral plans when necessary, maintaining a close relationship with the consumer supervisor to educate them on working with this population, providing feedback to the consumers in the present, and helping them to maintain a work environment that is free from distraction. I would say the number one challenge I have working with this population is impaired self-awareness. Consumers that I have worked with tend to have reduced awareness and overestimate their abilities while underestimating their problems. Other challenges that are frequently presented in this population are impulsiveness or poor judgment. In my opinion, VR counselors need partnerships with community providers specializing in traumatic brain injury and cross-training among agencies. Additional community rehab providers that specialize in TBI are also needed in many counties. Communication with employers is also key when helping traumatic brain injury survivors return to work. My main goal in working with employers is to promote an interdisciplinary team approach while ensuring that all team members are consistent in utilizing the same strategies for targeting behaviors or goals 
leading to a successful employment outcome. Overall, my experience with the supported employment model has been very successful. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Now we're going to turn to Maria Crowley. As a state head injury coordinator, Maria, can you describe any trends you've noticed related to persons who have TBI and their quest for gainful employment? And I also would like to learn what approaches has your agency used to support clients with TBI to return to work? In your experience, which critical information that VR practi practitioners need but missing in current research is related to supporting the employment of persons with TBI? Ha and how do you believe research could help to advance the field regarding supporting employment of persons with TBI? Maria? Thank you, Cindy, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Um, We've heard such useful and accurate information already from uh, the other two speakers um, from a, res a research perspective and from a direct service perspective. As someone who started out on the front lines as a job coach and now coordinates the program for the state of Alabama uh, with brain injury, uh, my view is very similar to what we've already heard in terms of what a lot of those trends and issues involve related to brain injury. And I would also go a step further to say that um, states, other states have the same experiences um, um, in working and collaborating with those other states um, within my program and with um, some of the organizations that I belong to. They express the same issues and concerns. Before I tell you a little bit about what some of the trends are within our own department, uh, I thought I would let you know a little bit about what happens here and how our program is organized. Our lead agency uh, for brain injury in Alabama is located within the Department of Rehabilitation Services, specifically within vocational rehabilitation. And we've had a long history of providing community-based services to individuals with TBI, uh, cognitive stimulation, recreation, social supports, housing, respite, care, attendant care, uh, and last but not least, uh, employment services. Uh, we've got a network of pre-vocational and vocational rehabilitation counselors, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the pre-vocational program here as it's unique to Alabama. We have a network of job coaches and employment specialists that have expertise in brain injury. We have an outside source for long-term supports for supported employment here, which is a little unique. And then we've got some strong partnerships with our Brain Injury Association here, with the Independent Living Program, with the Children's Program, with our model system, certainly, and with the hospital statewide. And all of that together makes for uh, the ability for us to maximize success for individuals with TBI here with employment as much as we can. Other states are organized very differently, but every state has to do what works best for its own state constituents. Um, there are very wonderful things happening in Virginia and in Maryland and in other states related to employment as well, but they're all very different and customized as things need to be for individuals with brain injury. Although every brain injury is unique, as you know, there are a lot of similar challenges and barriers um, that those with brain injury encounter or engage in that we've noted here as well. Uh, I would like to start um, sharing a little bit about self-awareness or the lack of self-awareness, as Dr. Kreitzer has touched on already, and decision-making. Um, often we find that that is a, an indicator as to whether or not someone's going to do well with employment. Um, individuals who have difficulty with in terms of brain injury with remembering or learning new information, who are inconsistent with their performance, who may have poor judgment and decision-making abilities, uh, who lack difficulty generalizing uh, current and old information to new situations and new job environments, who also have a lack of awareness of these difficulties, often have a difficult time with employment. 
that creates a lot of frustration for the individual, for the service provider or the vocational rehabilitation counselor, and for that individual support system. Speaking of family supports, that's something else that we find that's so important. And the lack of family supports are certainly a challenge in terms of employment. It doesn't seem to matter what level of severity that brain injury is. Without good family supports, individuals are not as successful with employment. You've heard a lot already about addiction issues with alcohol and drugs. When individuals are not in control of those substances, they're often not in control of their employment situation as well. Also, when you think about addiction issues, that is an added stressor on an, on an already stressed support system with the family. Stamina um, and fatigue, individuals who have a difficult time making it through a full work day or keeping up a pace in an employment situation that that business is asking them to do um, also complicates things in terms of employment. It's very important to find out what an individual's optimal times are for study or for work tasks um, in terms of, of work. Very important for a vocational rehabilitation counselor to take a look at. One of the most important issues or barriers can be the ability or the inability to form and maintain relationships. Social skills and social disconnects are often much more of an impairment than sometimes the actual functional limitations that an individual may have due to brain injury. It's a fact people and businesses hire who they like. Um, so much of who we are is what we do in our jobs. And individuals with brain injury are no different. We make friendships with the people that we work with. Uh, we want to be satisfied with the employment that we have, and that job satisfaction is often closely linked to the relationships that individuals make there. Most people want to have friends in the workplace, and if someone has a difficult time with forming relationships or having good, strong social skills due to behavior dysfunction, that makes things very challenging. The availability or the lack of availability of resources in a community uh, transportation specifically, but not just limited to that, um, often the availability of resources in terms of job coaches, job uh, placement specialists, uh, physicians, practitioners, certainly neuropsychologists um, and neuropsychiatrists having uh, a shortage of those in a state uh, makes for a lot of difficulty in getting good information and good supports where someone is. And we know that's key to provide those things where someone is. And last but not least, just the variability of the individual consumers that we work with. Everyone is so different. Um, it's difficult to create a one, um, one solution that's going to be successful for every single person. And when you overlay all of these barriers uh, with the fact that brain injury is a hidden disability and people want to deal with what they see, Dr. Kreitzer also mentioned to you that employer expectations um, are high um, in terms of production and someone's ability to fit in. It makes for a mix of lots of, of difficulties if these things aren't addressed. Um, and in terms of service providers and their level of expertise, um, it's important that not only placement specialists and job coaches and VR staff are well versed with all the nuances that come along with brain injury, it's also important that the mental health system, um, physicians, educators, psychologists, all are well versed as, as well. Um, just because someone has a medical degree or a nursing degree does not mean that they know how to treat brain injury. We see that time and again. Um, often assumptions are made uh, or the brain injury gets missed because it's a hidden disability and that creates a lot of difficulty for the individual that's out there trying to go to work. 
the more awareness that we can create about brain injury um, leads to more success for that individual and their employment and for more funding so that we can do what, what works, um, as that is an issue in almost every state, the lack of funding. In terms of looking at successful approaches and strategies that we have implemented here, um, I'll come back to what I mentioned before, which is the pre-vocational program that we have. It's an interactive community-based model. It's a network of vocational rehabilitation counselors that focus on an individual from the time they get home from the hospital to help them transition back into community involvement and then gradually ease into the world of work. Um, we find that making a nice, smooth transition from home to community back to work creates the most successful situation here in terms of employment. And not only is it successful, it's also highly cost effective. Um, in providing pre-vocational services, uh, we reduce the cost of post-acute care here. We reduce the time of referral to vocational rehabilitation overall uh, to well below the national average. And it contributes to increasing wage averages um, when someone participates in a pre-vocational program once they're successful in going to work. Without that, we find that people often fall through the cracks. Um, good neuropsychological assessment and feedback is so important. Uh, we have very high expectations here because of the work that's been done at the TBI model system with UAB and Dr. Novak and his staff there. Um, they have set the bar very high in terms of getting good, accurate, functional information from a neuropsych assessment. And we use that time and again with individuals with TBI that we, that we work for. We get a lot of customized information from those. And the vocational rehabilitation counselors have been trained on what to ask and uh, how a feedback is structured to get the most out of that for the individual and the family. We find that starting low and building slow has kind of become a motto within our VR system for brain injury. Often where individuals with traumatic brain injury start, it's not usually where they end up. And they find that frustrating. That's hard for some individuals. But easing back into school or work is best. We believe that that, that works here. If at all possible, we encourage individuals to participate in a lengthy college prep course that's offered by our community rehabilitation programs here. We do a lot of auditing of classes. We work a lot on part-time employment before engaging in longer, more competitive employment. We utilize uh, volunteer experiences or unpaid work experience a good deal. We find it very helpful. Um, it's certainly allowed by the Department of Labor. And we carry liability insurance um, for businesses to feel more comfortable having someone in a position that's unpaid. It gives the counselor an idea of what someone can do. And it gives the individual an idea of what they can do and what they can't do. Um, again, kind of coming back to that lack of awareness of skills and deficits. It really helps if they can get used to working before they commit to working by either volunteering or by doing something that's unpaid for a, a limited amount of time. We do a lot of long-term follow-up before closure here. Um, the rules and regulations that govern vocational rehabilitation dictate 90 days. Um, before closure, after someone goes to work. Often with a case that involves traumatic brain injury, that is going to be six months or more. And it depends solely on how that individual is doing. And there's a lot of follow-up all along the way and beyond that time. And that's for someone that's not in a supported employment caseload. We have TBI-specific vocational rehabilitation counselors here in Alabama. Uh, they consistently have the highest wage averages statewide of the other VR counselors. I like to uh, brag on them a little bit. Uh, the reason for that, we believe, is because they know those consumers. They have smaller caseloads. Uh, 
They spend a lot more time with those individuals. They can afford to do that because the caseload size is small. They do a lot more evaluative measures, which takes more time on the front end, but it gets good results on the back end. And then that, that waiting to um, close a case before they feel like someone's ready um, happens here. We aren't able to have a specialty TBI caseload everywhere in Alabama, but we do for the areas where there's a higher population of individuals with brain injury, um, and we see that it works. And Allison's already delineated a number of very uh, successful strategies in terms of helping people compensate for changes that have occurred for them. Um, I'd like to point out that a lot of the accommodations that she mentioned um, that we teach uh, to service providers, job coaches, and businesses um, that work well for individuals with brain injury also work well for other types of disabilities as well, learning disabilities, uh, disabilities that involve attention and social skills um, and uh, neurobehavioral issues, mental health issues you know, can benefit from the same kinds of accommodations that happen for individuals with TBI. And often that's a selling point um, within vocational rehabilitation. Limiting distractions, redirecting when someone's focus is lost, um, encouraging them to capture information in several formats when they go on an interview and when they're starting work, um, providing several solutions to a problem. Um, those kinds of things, keeping things structured in the workplace, those work well for lots of different types of disabilities too. In terms of looking at critical information that's needed to support employment and traumatic brain injury, um, having good evidence-based community outcomes um, um, from work that's done, and sharing that information is key. We've gathered lots of good information here um, related to employment and those co-occurring issues from the model systems and the work that the model systems have done, specifically um, the work that Dr. Kreitzer's done with caregivers, um, the work that's gone on in Ohio uh, with um, Corrigan's research in substance use and abuse and employment and um, the work that's happened at Mount Sinai um, with screening and employment and um, behavior have been very helpful to us here in Alabama. The articles that have come from that, the, the research that's come from um, the database from the model systems has been great for us to have. Um, one of the biggest challenges with vocational rehabilitation counselors here, and I feel that Alyssa would probably agree with me on this, is that they often have a big full caseload and they don't have a lot of time for reading research and getting the bigger picture um, outside their own department about what's going on with employment trends and with vocational rehabilitation in other places. Anything that we can do to help counselors with that would be key and more interaction between what happens with research and the service sector I think is also important. Um, a lot of what happens here is ongoing education. We provide core competencies training to all of our uh, TBI staff and placement specialists and job coaches um, annually and quarterly in lots of different venues so that they can have information about what's going on and what's most successful with employment. And there are a lot of wonderful national resources that have great materials that we use. Um, the Centers for Disease Control, certainly. Um, NASHA, the National Association for State Head Injury Administrators, does a lot of training and mentoring to states. Uh, and state programs on brain injury resources and materials. Um, but there are good things to be had from SAMHSA, from HRSA, and a number of other uh, national resources as well. We also find that it, if at all possible, um, if we can get vocational rehabilitation staff out and collaborating at a national events, interagency conferences, um, other meetings, so that they can gather that information um, beyond their own states, we find that to be very helpful as well.
And then lastly, in taking a look at um, what is needed um, in terms of research um, and employment, what's missing um, that I would like to see um, that we have not been able to find much on that I feel the vocational rehabilitation counselors here uh, would love to have is something related to employment maintenance um, and social skills and supports. Um, post-employment. Once someone goes to work and they're doing well, how do we ensure that they continue to do well by providing supports for them while they're working? Anything related to behavior, as I mentioned before, um, behavior and social skills often get in the way, uh, much more so than any other um, deficits that an individual might be experiencing. Um, something we tried here that we have found anecdotally to be very effective um, for individuals that are already working is a replication of the emotional regulation um, study that Dr. Gordon has done at Mount Sinai, um, which is an education and treatment program offered via GoToMeeting for individuals with TBI. Uh, we have had run two groups and found that to be very successful, and they can receive that education where they are after work as a group, and they have found a lot of comfort and guidance in maintaining their employment that way. And anything else that we might can gather that's related to uh, research and employment with associated or with secondary health issues, um, dementia, obesity, eating lifestyles, exercise, nutrition, aging, suicide prevention, the things that come um, along uh, as we live that also affect individuals with TBI is, would be most useful. Um, specifically, information for our aging population and aging labor market. Thank you so much, Maria. Now we're going to turn to the topic of practice guidelines. A previous webcast focused on the potential application of practice guidelines in VR service delivery. Let us pick up that discussion here. I want to turn to our presenters. Do you believe that practice guidelines or written guidelines would be useful tool for VR practitioners in helping them to deepen and define the application of effective interventions or promising practices for TBI survivors to support their return to work? If so, what are the benefits of having practice guidelines? Dr. Kweiser, why don't you start off our discussion from a researcher's perspective? Sure, thank you. That's a, that's a simple question with a, a fairly straightforward answer, and that's the kind of question I like. Um, there, there are clear advantages to having practice guidelines. Practice guidelines provide empirically based information to guide uh, care. They help shape the expectations that clients and their families have about the nature of service delivery and likely outcomes. And they are also helpful to train effective vocational uh, professionals and also helpful for developing efficacious programs. Thank you so much, Dr. Kweiser. Um, Alyssa. Yes. Would you please share with us your view about the benefits of practice guidelines in the VR service delivery? Yes, thank you. I absolutely agree. Um, I think having the VR practice guidelines is very useful, especially you know to promote a universal model, and it also allows VR counselors to be consistent, you know, in the services that we're providing to this population. For us in Maryland, ever since we adopted, you know, the practice guidelines of evidence-based employment, it significantly improved our, our outcome with this population. Terrific. So how about uh, Maria, what's your perspective? Oh, I certainly agree as well. Um, it's helpful. It would be helpful for training um, new staff and giving seasoned staff some new ideas and approaches that would be proven to be, you know, successful um, for those that are working in the field. You know, and, and 
better training will create better services for the individuals that are being served and should lead to you know, more satisfaction with work, better wages, longer term employment outcomes. Oh, terrific. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, what type of information should the practice guidelines include? Again, let's begin with Dr. Kweiser. Practice guidelines should address commonly encountered complex and challenging situations. And what I mean by that is um, it, sh it should be no surprise if we uh, see clients who have, for example, issues with substance abuse. Uh, we often find that clients have difficulty managing stress, and although going back to work can be a good thing, it can also challenge people's stress tolerance and issues of uh, substance abuse. Guidelines should also address principles of practice. What is it that guides what we do to serve our clients? Uh, guidelines should include the, uh, detailed definitions and descriptions and of types of employment services available. Uh, people often think they're talking about the same thing, but sometimes unless what they're talking about is well defined, they're actually talking about different issues. Guidelines should provide foundational information on brain injury, employment, prognostic factors, and the benefits of different approaches to vocational intervention. And guidelines should also provide some information on the reliability and validity of assessment approaches. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Kweiser. So, Alyssa, what is your perspective on this? Um, I also agree again. I think that they should provide, you know, typical issues faced by this population. Uh, basic information on brain injury is also helpful uh, when training new staff on evidence-based practices. Um, and also, I think the typical challenges, you know, such as behavioral issues, substance abuse, um, Mental health issues uh, should also be addressed in the practice guidelines to help staff in working with this population. Wonderful. Thank you, Lista. So, Maria, anything to add? Uh, in addition to what's been said, um, I think um, really the only thing I would add to that would be um, something that the practice guideline could point out would be differences between um, serving those with brain injury versus other kinds of disabilities within um, the vocational rehabilitation process in the event that um, those who are not working with brain injury daily you know, can have supports because that does happen um, with states. Uh, expectations um, within um, the VR system for defining what a successful outcome is for somebody with brain injury because it may look very different than what they would see with someone with another type of disability. Um, what does job stability and satisfaction look like for TBI? And then anything that could be in there in terms of employment maintenance and social supports for employment. Right. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Well, let's hear from our presenters about who should be involved in developing practice guidelines. And Dr. Kweiser, what is your thought? Well, in, in rehabilitation, I think one of the things we can pride ourselves in is being inclusive. And so at, at least I would say at the very top of my list would be obviously people with brain injury and their family members. Um, Mar Maria talked a little bit about the importance of integrating research and clinical practice, uh, it would be important to have vocational researchers involved as well as service providers, advocacy organizations such as uh, local brain injury associations, and obviously government, which would include state and local agencies. Well, terrific. Thank you, Dr. Kweiser. Alyssa, what is your view? Um, just to add to that, I would probably say, you know, also vocational rehabilitation specialists and the employment specialists that work with these consumers uh, through the community rehabilitation providers. Uh, also, you know, professional organizations um, that work with consumers and perhaps educators. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. So, Maria, anything to add? I think we've we've hit on everybody, a representative from every group that we might, you know, want to have be involved with that. I think it would be interesting to possibly survey those providers um, initially to see 
what they view their needs to be, really to do a needs assessment, you know, and see what sort of format might work best for them. Wonderful. Thank you, Maria. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, is there anything else, um, any, anything, any topic that we have not discussed that you would like to share with the listeners? Now, let's begin with Dr. Quezer. Well, I, I think one good thing is that we've come a very long way in our ability to provide vocational uh, services to people with traumatic brain injury. And it's interesting because when, when people early on talked about vocational rehabilitation, they really spent a lot of time talking about all the problems, all the negatives, all the things that were wrong with people with brain injury and the challenges they faced. And so one of the things that we're beginning to learn is about the importance of focusing on the positive aspects of our clients. So the, the, the topics that I think would be very important to understand are um, how to recognize the personal strengths of our clients, um, the value of patience and persistence as a personality characteristic that maybe can be modified a little bit. We know that our clients make lots of mistakes, and obviously it's, it's important for people to learn from mistakes, but it's not really going to be much help to, fo oh, we, uh, to encourage our clients to focus on what's, what they've done wrong in their lives. And another issue that I'd like to see addressed in programs is people's willingness to ask for help from others, and there's a, there's a moderate amount of uh, th there's a point in the middle. Some people ask for help with everything. Some clients feel like they can't do anything right, and some clients don't want any help and see asking for help as a shortcoming. So the issue of helping clients decide on who to ask for help and how much to ask for and when to ask for help, uh, I, I believe, could be addressed in some of the behavioral and psychosocial programs. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Kreiser. Um, Alyssa, other topics that you would like to share with our listeners today? Um, just from my perspective and working with this population to assist them in obtaining employment, I just think involving the individual directly in the planning process rather than, you know, having the team or family members trying to plan for them, but by directly engaging them and maintaining that open communication, I just think that's key in achieving successful employment outcomes. Um, also, I think with this population, it's also important to remember that no two consumers are alike. So services really do need to be individualized in order for them to achieve success. Well, thanks so much, Alyssa. That's wonderful. Um, Maria, anything uh, from you? Um, we have learned so much about brain injury um, over the last several years. Uh, we have more to learn, but we already have, have learned a lot of valuable um, lessons about what works best. Um, with traumatic brain injury, you know, again, I would say it cannot be emphasized enough how unique TBI is, how different every individual is, and that there's no one-size-fits-all approach um, for successful vocational rehabilitation um, and employment intervention um, with brain injury. Uh, it has to be customized to each individual's strengths um, and, and challenges, and um, we really need to take a look at really defining what successful employment is uh, for someone with a brain injury um, in terms of length of employment and type of employment. Um, it matters. Um, and I guess lastly I would say, you know, that um, the three of us would be happy, you know, if for anyone that participates with the webinar, um, to share any more information about resources and materials that we use or um, the programs that we have, we'd be happy to do that. Terrific. Thanks so much, Maria. And also, thanks, everyone. Well, that concludes our discussion today. Thank you very much to all our presenters. We hope that our listeners will find this webcast to be informative. I want to remind you that today's event is one of a series of webcasts on knowledge translation from VR research to service delivery. Also, we intend that these webcasts will foster the creation of a community of practice where this dialogue among researchers, educators, practitioners, policymakers, and other stakeholders can continue 
to inform and serve those dedicated to vocational rehabilitation and its goals. To stimulate more discussion, we invite listeners to contact us to provide your input on today's webcast, share your thoughts on future webcast topics, and participate in the community of practice to continue the dialogue. We would really love to hear from you because your views can inform and shape our future work. You can contact us at the email address shown on the screen, ktdrr at sedl.org. We would also appreciate your input about the webcast by completing a brief online evaluation form. The link is here on the last page of the PowerPoint slide. Everyone who registered will also get an email with a link to the evaluation form. Once again, I want to thank Joanne Starks and Williams and our new colleagues at CEDL and all of the staff here at AIR. We also appreciate the support from NIDER to carry out the webcast and other activities. On this final note, I'd like to conclude the webcast. We look forward to your participation in our future events. Thanks, everyone.